We are going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 15. Luke 15. The gracious and forgiving Father. The gracious and forgiving Father. Amen. Should I, should I keep with tradition and, and make you guys stand like Pastor Derek does? Yeah. Okay, please stand with me, would you, for the reading of God's Word. <laughs> Beginning in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. <clears throat> and when he has come home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it and when she has found it she calls her friends and neighbors together and says rejoice with me for I have found the peace which I lost likewise I say to you there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents father God we come to you tonight God and we know Lord that you are a gracious compassionate pursuing father and we know, Lord God, that when someone gives their life to you, when someone repents and surrenders to the living God, there is joy breaking out. There is worship in heaven over one lost sinner. And God, I'm thankful that I'm one of those sinners. And I'm thankful that this room is filled with one of those sinners. And when we gave our lives to you, God, there was a party in heaven. And I pray tonight, Lord God, as we look into your scriptures that we would see the party is because you're rejoicing. That all that you have for us and, and your love for us captivated our hearts and brought us to the same knowledge of who you are. And God, tonight, as we look at what it means to be lost and what it means to be found, Father, I pray tonight that you truly are illuminated in the midst of this. So God, bless our time tonight as we open up your scriptures. May your scriptures open up our heart. May we receive. May you convict. May you change. May you draw us closer to you tonight. In Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen. amen. So tonight, uh, we're looking at the gracious and forgiving father. Many people look at this story and they look at uh, three, uh, lost, um, three, three illustrations of being lost. And it's true, there are three illustrations of being lost in the scriptures. But tonight, we're looking at um, a story that Jesus communicated, and there was a, a specific reason, be reason behind it. Now, if you were ever to go online and look up greatest storytellers story ever told, do you realize Jesus' name isn't on there? Yeah. You know, there's many names, uh, many storytellers, Shakespeare, and many people who wrote beautiful stories. Jesus' name isn't on there, but to me, I think Jesus is the greatest storyteller ever. Amen? Uh, tonight, he brings forth a parable, searching for the lost, he's talking about, and, and um, how a shepherd will look for sheep. Uh, lost sheep. Now, first off, um, lost people uh, are, or people of God are identified as sheep. Um, why? Well, number one, she sheep are are unable to take care of themselves. They are in need of someone to watch over them. They, they wander uh, and have a tendency to fall into all kinds of danger. They have no mind of their own. Basically, they're stupid. Hey, 
before I got saved, and as intelligent and smart and altogether I had, I thought I had it, I was really stupid. Because my stupidity and my pride in the things that I did got me in all kinds of trouble. Trouble that God was with me and spared me through the whole time until I gave my life to him. You know, um, when you are lost and you don't know it, the, the, as Jesus said, narrow is the path, right? That leads to salvation. But wide is the road to destruction and many go in it. It's because we're dumb. We're prideful. We're arrogant. We're blind. We don't realize we're lost. We're, we're full of, of, of um, ourselves thinking that we can do it ourselves. Sheep, I think, are a good illustration of that for us because of that very thing. We don't realize our need for the Father. And a, a, a sheep needs a shepherd. And a shepherd, a good shepherd, not a hireling, will lay his life down for the shepherd. And we see that um, he's talking to sinners, publicans, tax collectors, and also the religious scribes and Pharisees. The very religious, okay? So there's, there's two people, he's a, two types of people he's addressing in this parable. They would understand what he was talking about. The lost coin. The lost coin represents um, a necklace. Uh, a necklace of ten coins. Uh, uh, it was a headband that a woman wore that signified she was married. Uh, losing one ruined the necklace and it was a huge embarrassment. And it, 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 it was something that she wore proudly. And, and losing a coin was something that the woman would be so embarrassed by she would search and look and and find and it says here she lit a lamp she did whatever she could to find it now in both of these stories when the when the lamb or the sheep was found and when that coin was found there was great rejoicing great rejoicing you know and that's an illustration of what happens as we read in heaven when someone who or something is lost we rejoice right it's an illustration that I want you to hold on to. Both sheep and coins represent lost sinners. Both are very valuable. People of God are referred to as sheep, as I said, and are very valuable. Sheep were, were uh, a very valuable commodity. They were like family. Uh, like, they were like pets, some of them, and they were loved and beloved. Like the coin, sinners bear the imprint of God. They are made in his image. We are made in his image. Just like a coin is stamped. But this lost coin, when they're lost, they're lost and they're out of circulation. What does it mean to be lost? Sheep are away from the safety and in a place of danger. They can't help themselves. Some sinners are lost, as I said, because of their own stupidity. A coin to be useless and uh, excuse me, a coin is useless and out of circulation or unsustainable or unusable by God if it's a lost coin. So if a person is lost, you're unusable by God. God has a plan for you, has a purpose for you. But if you're not uh, walking in a relationship with God, it is, is not valuable to God to be used by him, but it is valuable to him because it's made in his image. Now, Coins have no consciousness of being lost, right? Some people are the same way. They're, they have no consciousness that they're lost. So there's two types of personalities we're looking here. There are those people who are just in rebellion, as we're going to see, and there are those that have no idea that they're lost. Some of them are lost by the carelessness of others. See, a coin to be found, you can't call out to it. You have to search for it with everything that you have. And in this case, it represents a person who doesn't know they're lost. They need to hear the gospel, right? How beautiful are the feet of those who take the gospel, right? How will they know if they're not told? And so the coin represents, for, uh, for our cases in the church, that we need to be people who share the gospel. We can't be careless with people that we know that are not walking with God. Oh, they're lost. They're just dumb. They won't get it. They have no idea who God is. But God still finds them valuable. And so we need to pursue them. Amen? Are you tracking with me? Okay. 
There's one other uh, lost illustration we're going to look at, and it's the parable of the lost son. This is the one that we're really going to focus on tonight. A lost son means to be out of fellowship with the father and away from the joys of the family. See, a sheep was lost and it was too stupid to know it was lost and was just out in danger living its life, uh, searching and being led astray into all kinds of danger, all right? That, that was me until I found God, right? Um, I also was part of that coin. I had no consciousness of, of being lost. In fact, I thought uh, that, you know, I was a Christian. I didn't realize that I, I was valuable to God. But a lost son... What does it mean to be a lost son? It means to be out of the fellowship with the father and away from the joys of the family, of the body of Christ, of of the, the, um, the way that God uses our lives for his glory, experiencing joy, walking in the favor of God, okay? We're gonna take a look at this son tonight, both of these sons. We're gonna see something. As in the first two there was a searching being done. There was a searching for that lost sheep. There was a searching for that coin. But as we look at the story of the prodigal son, the father doesn't search. He waits. It's significant that the father did not go searching for the son, but waited at home for the boy to come back. Because the as we take a look at this, the son was lost because of his own willfulness. And the father had to wait until that will was broken and submissive. So it does no good as we look at this son. The father knew my son, as we read this, he was rebellious hateful even. So let's take a look at this. Verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together his things, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living or wasteful and extravagant living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. We're going to take a look. The main character in this parable is the forgiving father whose character remains constant through the story. It is a picture of God. In telling the story, Jesus identifies himself with God and his loving attitude toward the lost. The younger symbolize the lost, the tax collectors and sinners of the day, And the elder brother represents the self-righteous, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law of that day. The major theme of this parable seems not to be uh, so much the conversation of the sinner as the previous two parables, but rather the restoration of a believer into fellowship with the Father. In the first two parables, the owner went out to look for what was lost, whereas the story of the father waits and watches eagerly for his son to return we see a progression through the three parables from the relationship of one in a hundred, right? One in, there was a hundred sheep, one left. He left the 95 in the wilderness. He left them and he went after the one. To one in 10, there was 10 coins. She searched high and low for that 10 to one and one, demonstrating God's love for each individual and his personal attentiveness towards all humanity. See, God loves everyone, and everyone is an individual. He knows you by name. He knows every hair in your head, and his desire is for you. We will see in the story the graciousness of the father overshadowing the sinfulness of the son 
as it is in the memory of the father's goodness that brings the prodigal son back to repentance as we see in Romans 2, 4, right? It's the kindness and goodness of God that brings us to repentance, amen? Amen. Well, as we see here, uh, the first point I'm gonna make in these first verses from 11 to 16 is this. Greed and selfishness leads us away from the father. Greed and selfishness, being inward focused, wanting what we want, being rebellious, just being in sin leads us away from the father. Though it was within his rights to ask, it was not a loving thing to do as it implied that he wished his father dead. In the culture back then, uh, the the older brother would get two thirds and the younger brother would get a third and that was their inheritance. But when do you get an inheritance? When your father, parents pass on or they give it to you in their final days right this is a self-focused person completely inward he looked at his dad and said i wish you were dead just give me what i got coming to me could you imagine that i'm sure it broke the father's heart but instead of rebuking his son which he could have the gracious and forgiving father patiently and graciously graciously granted him his request. This is a picture of God letting a sinner go his own way. Have you ever had someone say, man, like I remember when I got saved, my older brother who's still not walking with the Lord, you know, knew I was at the church and I'm serving at the church and, and I'm doing all these things at the church. And he said, man, have you called our nephews? I've got three nephews from my little brother and, and they're out in the world. They're as out there as you can get. And he kind of said something to me. He said, why aren't you going after them? Why aren't you calling them? Why aren't you going to get them? And this isn't a man of a, you know, he's natural minded. I said, Chris, you can't turn somebody if they don't want to be turned. You, you can't tell them if they're not ready to listen. I, I can't drag them to the church. I can't drag them to God. You have to want God. And then he opens up the doors, right? This is why the father let the son go because he knew that he was in rebellion. He knew that he was full of himself. And he knew, and God knows that sometimes you and I have to go out and we have to learn our lesson the hard way. Now, I'm grateful in my own life when I did that, that God was with me and he graciously spared my life time and time again. And you know the father was praying for him. You know the father was waiting for him. And God spared him. This is also a picture of God sharing his wealth. Right? This is a picture of the father, of God, God sharing his wealth, the son, with a world of lost sinners. And they have wasted it. Amen? Jesus came 2,000 years ago. God gave his utmost for us. He hung on a cross, and there are people that are spitting on it. The wealth of heaven, of salvation, can only be received by a willing heart. We all possess this foolish ambition to be independent, amen? Which is at the root of the sinner's persistent sin. No one could tell me different. No one could tell me different. I so identify now, as in this uh, parable, maybe you're identifying with one of these characters. I so identify with the son because that was me. I was a prodigal son. My mom was a believer. I thought I was a believer, but man, I went out into the world at 18, 19 and just went for it. Prodigal living just like this son because I had foolish ambition. I wanted to be rich and famous. I wanted it all. Maybe you have felt that way or maybe you have children or you know somebody that is going after the world's riches. And I thought I was walking with God. I thought I, had a re- I thought I was a Christian. I didn't know what it meant to be walking, but I did think I was a Christian because I went to school. I mean, excuse me, I went to Sunday school as a kid and I attended a church. And even at 18 years old, I got water baptized. Now, I'd never been told the gospel. I didn't know what that was, but people said, hey, if you want to be a Christian, you need to be baptized. You know, they put the cart before the horse, which many... Uh, churches do they don't make sure that someone is soundly saved before you 
go into the baptismal waters. Now, we're going to have those uh, tomorrow night, and there will be people that are getting baptized, and I'm going to explain what baptism is. It's a proclamation. You're telling the world what God has already done. Well, I didn't know that. So, I lived in Romans 1, 21. For, all, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That was me. And that is his son. A sinful state also is a state of constant discon- discontent. It was never enough. It was never enough for me. You may be, have... Uh, relate to this it was before getting saved it was just never enough there was there was just never enough party never enough girls never enough money it was just never enough and that's what drove me and drove me into the ground I can I'm sure that's uh, what we see here with this uh, first prodigal son verse 16 so funny he said and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. Even these unclean animals seem to be better off than he was at this point. This is a picture of the state of a lost sinner or a rebellious Christian who has returned to a life of slavery to sin. Okay, With his father, he wasn't a slave. He, he wasn't a servant. He was a son. He knew what that meant. It's a picture of what sin really does to a person's life when he rejects the Father's will. Sin always promises more than it gives, takes takes you further than you wanted to go, and leaves you worse off than you were before. Let's say that again. Sin always promises more than it gives, takes you further than you wanted to go, and leaves you worse off than you were before. Sin promises freedom but it brings slavery. And this young man was experiencing that. He became a slave to sin. He left free as a son, and he went and entangled himself with the affairs of the world. Putting your trust in riches of the world will always leave you empty, unsatisfied, desperate, and destitute. The world does not fulfill its promises, but it takes them from you. It takes the promises of God from you. Sin will take your promises. And it happened with this man. Number one, greed and selfishness leads away from the Father. Point number two, brokenness and repentance leads back to the Father. Verse 17, but when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to, excuse me, bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise, I will go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Make me like one of your hired servants. The son begins to reflect on his condition and realizes that his father's servants had it better than he did. His painful circumstances help him to see his father in a new light and to bring hope. Now we could be seeing that this might just be a change of mind saying, wow, man, I've got no more money left. I got no more friends. Uh, I got nothing to eat. At least if I go back to my dad's house, I can, I can get fed, right? Uh, a very uh, superficial, this, this could not be a repentance, but just trying to get back into uh, graces of God and get a meal, right? But we see that's not the case. We see that's not the case because he's willing, he's willing to give up his sonship. This is the reflective of a, of a sinner when he or she discovers the destitute condition of his life because of sin. It is the realization that apart from God, there is no hope. This is when a repentant sinner comes to his senses. And that's what he says here. But when he came to himself, man, it came crashing down on him. This was not just a hungry stomach. He was beat down. He was destitute. He was in the throes of, of hunger and pain. And it says even the people that he, the, the sinners, the, the, the um, 
the, the Gentiles that he connected himself with wouldn't even pay attention to him, wouldn't even feed him, and the very swine that he couldn't, wasn't, that were against his uh, dietary religious laws, he said, man, just, if I just have one of, their, one of their pieces of food. It was not the badness of his life that brought the boy to his senses. It was not his mistakes. It was not the badness of his life, but the goodness of his father. He started to remember. He started to remember all that he had and what his father did for him, how kind he was. Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? We're not just leaving sin. We're not just leaving and trying to do good. When, when you have the knowledge of who God is, when, when the gospel opens up your eyes and when you know the goodness of your Father and how much He loves you, it begins to do work. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us that in while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. This is a picture of, of us knowing it. And, and the son knew he didn't deserve anything. He said, I'll just become like a hired servant. I'll just, I'll just be a slave. Maybe my dad will just let me be a slave. Like he did not consider or think that he would get back in the, in the graces of his dad. True repentance. He knew that he messed up. He turned from it and he went back home. Repentance, right? Repentance is to change direction. Now there is a intellectual repentance in your mind where you know you're doing something wrong and you just stop doing it and you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. And you change directions like a bank robber. Let's say you rob banks for 25 years and you come to your senses like, you know, this is wrong and I'm tired of doing this. So I'm not going to rob banks anymore and I'm just going to stop. But you don't ever look to pay restitution. You don't ever look to give the money back. You keep it all. That type of repentance is not, that's a guilt. But sorrowful repentance leads someone to salvation, right? If I was to be a bank robber and I was broken and I wanted to be like Zacchaeus and just give it all back, that is true repentance. Well, this son repented. He went back with his tail between his legs, broken and beat up, hoping hoping that his father would just make him a slave. He is willing to give up his rights as his father's son to take on the position of a servant. That's how we know he repented. He realizes he had no claim. He had no right to claim a blessing upon his father's uh, household, nor does he have anything to offer except a life of service in repentance of his previous actions. With that, he is prepared to fall at his father's feet and hope for forgiveness and mercy. Amen? This is exactly what conversion is all about. Ending a life of slavery to sin through confession to the father and faith in Jesus Christ and becoming a slave to righteousness, offering one's body as a living sacrifice, as it says in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, uh, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable act of worship. Amen? This is what the son did. He went back and he said, he threw himself at the mercy of his father. Well, verses 20 through 24 Point number three, we see the father is patiently waiting, watching, and welcoming. The father's waiting, watching, and welcoming. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. But the father interrupted and said, But the father said to his servants, Hurry, bring out the best robe, put it on him, and put, it, put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here. Kill it. Let us eat. Let's be merry. Let's rejoice. We're having a party. My son came home. Such a, such a symbol and an illustration of the father's heart, right? He didn't, he, he, the father's love, first off, 
drove him to be undignified, okay? So back in, in the Eastern time, it was very uh, uh, unlike an elder man to run. They wore tunics, they walked everywhere. It was undignified, it was not respectful. And it says, he arose and came to his father, but when his father, uh, still was a great way, his father had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. As I said, during that time, it, it was not the custom of men to run, yet the father runs to greet his son. Why would he break convention for this wayward child who had sinned against him? The obvious answer is because he loved him and he was eager to show him that love and restore the relationship. That is our God. He's eager to restore the relationship, right? He's eager. When the father reaches his son, not only does he throw his, not only does he throw his arms around him, but he also greets him with a kiss of love. He was also protecting him from harm that could have come. Because the way his son left, it was known through the land how he disgraced his father, how he spit on him. And by law, the way his actions was deserving of being stoned to death, right? Deuteronomy talks about it. Parents could stone their kids to death. Aren't you glad we don't get to do that? Is there any kids in here? No. Okay. I mean, that is a pretty harsh form of punishment. I'm glad my, I'm sure my daughter's glad that we don't do that, but they could have stoned him to death. So there was a couple different reasons. The father was looking at him because he was waiting for him and he wanted to welcome him back. He wanted to shower him with mercy. He wanted to show that he loved him. There was no condemnation. He didn't want to beat him up and, and beat him down. He went out to protect him because he knew as he was watching, his son came home. He could tell by his countenance. He could tell by his body posture. I'm sure I'm speculating, but the father knew. He didn't come home, you know, yo, dad, I'm home. right the way he left he didn't come home the way he left he came home a different person he was so filled with joy at his son returned that he didn't even let him finish his confession nor does he question or lecture him instead he unconditionally gives, forgives him and accepts him back into the fellowship of his household father running to his son greeting him with a kiss and, and ordering the celebration is a picture of how our heavenly father feels towards sinners who repent so good you know often people feel like they can't come back to God they feel like they're just so like he could never forgive me I've done too much you don't know what I've done and I felt that at one time and maybe you're in here maybe you know somebody that feels like man you just don't know what I've done you know, and I thought I did a lot. And I did. I, I sinned much. And then I started meeting other people who sinned much. And God's not looking at the level of our sin. He's seeing, he's seeing the humility of our repentance. He's not looking at all we did. He's not holding that against us. Because Jesus paid for all that. He's saying, come, come. You humble yourself and you, you have it all. My heart's for you. Maybe someone needs to hear that tonight. Or maybe you know that you need to tell somebody. It's not, it's, it's, it's not what you've done in your sin. It's how you come back to the Lord in repentance. Second Peter, uh, it says... Um, God, excuse me, God greatly loves us, patiently waits for us to repent so he can show us his great mercy. So God greatly loves us. He's patiently waiting for us so he can show us his great mercy because he does not want any to perish. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some call, count slackness, but in, is patient toward you, not one wishing that any should perish, but that all should come and reach repentance amen he was restored back into full privilege of being the father's son he was given a robe which is a sign of dignity and honor proof of the prodigal's acceptance back into the family he was given the ring a, a sign of authority and sonship 
He was given sandals, a sign of not being a servant, as servants did not wear shoes, or for that matter, rings or any kind of expensive clothing. Like the God, just lavished him back in. No ifs, ands, or buts. No, son. Come on. Isn't that what God does to us? So good. A fatted, gaff, fatted calf is prepared and a, and a party is held. Uh, notice that there was bloodshed. You know, atonement for sin. The father said, go, the fatted calf, do, go, go, go. The fatted calf were, were weighted. That, that's what they brought to the Lord for atonement. They were saved for special occasions, such as the day of atonement. I mean, that was really special. Hence why the, as we see the other son, he's going to really look at that and he's going to have a hard heart towards it. But this was not just a party. It was a rare and complete celebration. Had the boy been dealt with according to the laws, I said, there would have been a funeral, not a celebration. Amen? There would have been a funeral according to the law. But aren't you glad for God's grace? Man, the funeral that we have is just dead to self and alive in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, number four. Religiosity blinds us to the Father's pleading. Religiosity blinds us to the Father's pleading. Verse 25. Now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Not a fatted calf, like the fatted calf. The one that was held special for the day of atonement. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, or look, or yo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots you killed the fatted calf for him and he said son you are always with me and all that i have is yours it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. The final and tragic character in the parable of the prodigal son is the oldest son who once again illustrates the Pharisees and the scribes. Outwardly, they live blameless lives, but inwardly, their attitudes were uh, abominable. This was true of the older son who worked hard, obeyed his father, and brought no grace, no, excuse me, no disgrace to his family or the township. It's obvious by his words and actions upon his brother's return that he is not showing love for his father or his brother. See, he was upset because dad gave in to his, his younger brother's request, took some of the inheritance, let him go. He's the one that's squeaky clean. He's the one that's obeying. He's the one that's doing everything the father asks. He's the, the one who comes to church all the time. He's the one that dresses the right way. He's the one who serves. He, you know what I'm saying? Follow me on this. He's the good son. The obedient son, the law, the rule keeper. And he was upset. There are sins of the spirit as well as sins of the flesh. Second Corinthians 7 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What does this mean? The religious leaders may not have been guilty of the gross things that the younger son did, but they are still sinners. 
guilty of a critical and unloving spirit. Pride and unwillingness to forgive, which we see is the character in the eldest son. Hard heart, prideful, full of himself. Just like the younger son, full of himself, wanted to go out and party at all. The younger son was full of himself because he thought he was all that. By staying outside of the house, the elder brother humiliated his father and his brother. His sins were no different. He may not have gone out for prodigal living, but his sin was pride and arrogance. Unloving. One of the duties of the uh, eldest son would have included reconciliation between the father and the son. If a father and son had a, had a falling out, like the oldest son should have stepped in and tried to have been, the, been the, the mediator, right? The one to bring them together and say, no, this is wrong, dad, this is wrong, bro. He would have been the host at the feast to celebrate his brother's return. The father could have commanded him to come in but he preferred to go out and meet him too. Just like he met the prodigal son. He went out just like God. And he met his oldest son where he was at and all of his religiosity and all of his pride and his arrogance. And he could have chastised him. He really could have punished him. Could have demanded and commanded. But God, who's rich in mercy and grace, right? He pleaded with him and he showed him mercy. Now keep in mind, this is what Jesus did with the Jewish religious leaders. That's what this parable is about. But they would not be persuaded. They thought they were saved because of their exemplary conduct, but were out of fellowship with the Father and needed to repent and seek forgiveness. See, that's where a religious people live person lives they see themselves and all their do goodiness and they're outward and I don't look like that person and I'm not that person and I'm not a hick and they're pointing their fingers at, at all the hypocrites in the church but they're not pointing themselves back because they're being just as hypocritical they're sitting there judging with a hard heart and no love it's a dangerous place to be beloved Jesus talked about the Pharisees and the washing of the outward cups and, and all the cleansing. No, it's the inwardness. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. Verse 29, as I said, look, or lo, or yo, dad, he says, instead of addressing me as father or my Lord. And again, in that disrespect, does the, the, nor does the father's compassion cease on him as he listens to his complaints and his criticisms. The boy appeals to his father's righteousness by proudly proclaiming his own self-righteousness in comparison to, the, to his brother's sinfulness. Right? What blindness he is by saying, this son of yours, this son of yours, the older brother avoids acknowledging that the prodigal is his own brother, his own flesh and blood. Just like the Pharisees, the older brother was defining his sin by outward actions, not inward attitudes, right? He's looking at his brother's actions. He didn't see that his brother came and repented and was broken. He's holding, he's taking the place of the judge. That's a very difficult place for us to, to stand, beloveds, right? Because with the same judgment you use, it will be used back to you. This judgment is not the judgment of bearing fruit, of seeing where someone's at, how you can encourage them, seeing people in sin and trying to encourage them and bring them to God's word and, and minister to them. We have that right, that type of judgment, we are to see a brother or sister in sin. We're to love them. We're to encourage them. We're to put our arm around them with grace and lead them to the scriptures. But the judgment that this Pharisee or this brother or many people do is they point fingers and they condemn. And they say, this is you. 
And they don't leave an open door for change. They don't leave an open door for love. They close it and they say, this is it. That is condemnation. And there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And the only one who can pass judgment to condemn is God the Father. Amen? Amen. So many times. And I've, look, I, I've, I've identified with both of these characters, even in my state. I am not standing up here um, saying that uh, I have not. And we all have, I believe, if you were to be honest with yourself, as you've grown and as you've walked in this sanctification process and allowed God to change your hearts, you've, you've probably found yourself being somewhat religious or judgmental or critical, thinking that what you do is better than everybody else or that person is wrong. And you may not even think you're great, but you're still pointing other people's faults out. That is not our calling, brothers and sisters. That was not the brother's calling. The brother's calling was calling called to reconciliation that's what he should have been doing he should have been right there with the father as I said in essence the older brother is saying that he was the one worthy of the celebration and his father had been ungrateful for all his work. <laughs> Lord, haven't you seen all I've done for you? Look at what I'm doing for you. How could you let this happen? How could that person get that? Or how, Don't you see what I do for you, God? That's a dangerous place to live, and that's where this son was. Dad, don't you see all I've done for you? Now, the one who had squandered his wealth was getting what he, the older son, deserved, he thought. And the father tenderly, lovingly, graciously addressed his oldest son as my son. Isn't that just like God? We, 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 come, and we're, we, we, we come with our poor behavior, our judgment, all that, and God still just pours grace out on him. Just like the father, he says, son, son. Father's response was, we had to celebrate. He corrects his error in, 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 in his thinking by referring to the prodigal son as this brother of yours. He brings him back down to, no, look, we're family. We are family. And in the body of Christ, if you call yourself a born again, we are family, brothers and sisters. That's the point behind this in the church, right? We can't be looking at everybody with a critical eye thinking we've a acquired something or attained something or reached some type of level of spirituality you're in a dangerous place if you're there because the ground at the cross is all level and we've all been given gifts and abilities and things to do for god but it's for the building up of the saints for the edifying of the church none of us have arised can i get an amen none of us have arrived the father says we had to celebrate suggests that the elder brother should have joined in the celebration and there should be a sense of urgency in not postponing the celebration of his brother's return. Heaven rejoices over a repentant sinner, amen, and we should too. And I've had people that uh, I was sitting with and counseling, people struggling, you know, with, with the church and all that and, and actually said to me, yeah, and I, I you know, I sit in there and I, and I see the same people go up the front all the time. What's that? They're trying to get attention. Oh, my heart broke. Like, people respond to the gospel. People come forward. People bear their soul and lay their life out before the Lord. It's, it's not to get attention. This son was not getting attention. We have to be careful. We cannot judge the intent of someone's heart. Only the word of God can do that. So if you see somebody repenting or coming up or asking for prayer for the same thing over and over again pour grace and mercy on him because God is God is the older brother's focus was on himself and as a result there was no joy in his brother's revival home he was so consumed with the issues of justice and equity that he fails to see the value of the brother's repentance and return. And that's what we can do when we're walking in religiosity. We have no joy. We have no joy for someone else. We look at everybody else. We think we're better. We're judging. Man, what a miserable place to be. 
and the Pharisees and scribes were miserable. And that brings on frustration and hate. What he fails to realize is that anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. He was in darkness. Whoever loves his brother and lives in the light and there is nothing in him that makes him stumble. Excuse me. Whoever loves his brother and lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and he does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. And his brother was blind, right? 1 John 2, 9 and 11. But the wise father seeks to bring restoration by pointing out all that he has. All that he has is and has always been available for the asking to his obedient son. It's all waiting. And it was his portion of the inheritance since the time of the allotment. The picture of the father receiving the son back into relationship is a picture of how we should respond to repentant sinners or someone who comes to you and asks for forgiveness. I don't care if it's the 10th time or the 20th time. We are to receive them because we don't know what God's doing in their heart. We have to give someone the benefit of the doubt. And this father was trying to point this out to the son. He's our, our brother's home. It doesn't matter what he's done. He's home. He's back. And if he still has some growth to do, and if he still has things to learn, praise God. So do we. Amen? Amen. Romans 3.23, all we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? All we, all have sinned. We are included in that all. And we must remember that all our righteousness are like filthy rags apart from Christ. It is only by God's grace that we are saved, not by works that we may boast. So if you're here tonight, and maybe you've been out in the world and you identify as, as trying to come home, you want to know who God is, you want to know who, 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 who this God that everybody talked about, what forgiveness and what hope is, you're in the right place tonight. And you'll have the opportunity to receive all that he has for you. Maybe you're here tonight and you're struggling with religiosity, looking down at your nose at people or, or judging people, being critical. Maybe you're not to the extent of a Pharisee or a scribe. I've, I've been critical and I've been judgmental. The great thing is, is God is a God of repentance and he receives it, right? It's his love and his kindness is here. Let me, let me replenish you. Let me pour out upon you. Come to me and ask. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and I will exalt you, right? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God is passionately in love with us. He is pursuing. He is patient. He is kind and full of grace and compassion, ready and willing to forgive the lowest of sinners and to the most self-righteous people who need no forgiveness. Psalm 103 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. But God, Ephesians 2, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself it is the gift of God not of works least anyone should boast let's pray Father we thank you God for your grace we thank you, Lord God, that you are a forgiving, loving, gracious, patient, patient, pursuing, merciful God. And we praise you tonight. We thank you, God. And, and Lord, I pray tonight as, as, 
as we've looked to your word and as if we find ourselves in that one place or the other where we're just walking in, in rebellion. We know what we're supposed to do, but we want to do our own thing and, and we're out doing it or, or we're struggling with one foot in and one foot out of rebellion. I pray tonight, Lord God, your word has called a sinner back to repentance. Or maybe if we find ourselves tonight in that place where we're, we're, we're doing everything by the book and, we're, and we're, we're, we're serving and we're keeping the rules, but we have no joy and we see other people with such joy and, and rewards and, and I don't get in. If they're in that place of, of struggle, God, I pray tonight that they would repent and that they would receive that love and that grace and that mercy and that redemption and that f- filling that feeling of peace and hope that they're so in need of. Tonight as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, I just want to extend the opportunity for us to pray tonight as a family. First, maybe you're here and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you you identify with that prodigal son. You're out in the world. You're beat up. You're unfulfilled, unsatisfied, ready to call it quits, thinking that there's no hope. I'm, I want to give you the opportunity to receive that hope tonight by just praying and receiving Christ. It's simple. As we see, it's called repentance. You just turn away from your old life and you turn to a new life in Christ. You humble yourself and you ask for forgiveness and you let God know that you need him and he will provide your needs more abundantly than you could ever imagine and the second is is maybe you find yourself tonight you're a believer but you're walking in rebellion you know that you need to come back 100% quit living out there quit doing the things you're doing or maybe you're the the religious son and you're hard hearted you're unfulfilled you're angry you're critical you have no joy tonight I'd like to just extend the opportunity to pray and repent so if you're here tonight and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you'd like to we're all family this is not to sing you out would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you just hold it up if you'd say yes I need to repent I need to give my life to Christ anyone at all I see your hand This is the night. This is the time. You can be brought back in and be clothed with righteousness. I see your hand in the back. You can be given the lavish love of the Father and be made a son or daughter and can all be wiped away. Anyone at all that needs to receive Christ. I see your hand in the back. Right where you're sitting, would you pray with me? It's just a prayer confession. It's to to the Lord through his son, Jesus Christ. It's just a prayer, heartfelt confession. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I realize that I'm separated from you by my sin. My sin keeps me from having a relationship with you. The things I do and say and think that break your heart, I'm sorry for. God, please forgive me. Wash me, cleanse me. Make me a righteous son or daughter. Bring me into the family. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might know Christ and be known by him, that I might be filled and sanctified and saved. I commit my life to you today and forevermore. Thank you for saving me by your death and resurrection on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. If you're here tonight and you want to pray and just ask God to forgive you and just to repent of your rebellion or your religiosity or your critical heart, pray with me. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for your word that is so good. It's so rich. It's, it's convicting. And God, we, we come to you tonight and we ask for forgiveness for our rebellion or for our religiosity, for our critical nature, or our rebellious nature. And we're asking, God, that you would cleanse us, that you would redeem us. Father, that you would 
wash us and bring us back into that relationship into the fellowship by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, forgive me for quenching your power in my life. Fill me again. Fill my cup to overflowing, God, that I would experience your grace, your mercy, and your joy. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, amen. Awesome.